Let's start the meeting of the Montpelier School Board of Directors. Um, Wednesday, March 30th at 6.34 p.m. Um, first order of business is public comment. Uh, so we have Mia re uh, joining remotely. Oh, okay. That's Zach. Zach remote too, I see his nameplate. Oh, there he is, okay, so. Uh, Zach, you missed Today's the first night that you have a nameplate at your, at your uh, seat. <laughs> Eric, you can move down if you want. <laughs> I think Atticut is um, not able to attend. So, uh, first order of business is public comment. Do we have any people either in person or on the phone, like Meg? Um, I'm Meg Bojan. Just a little bit ago. <laughs> um, I'm just here as a student uh, athlete advocate for the new track. I said it was on the agenda, and I just wanted to say woohoo uh, track. And I think it's a really awesome opportunity, and it has a lot of great benefits for our school and our community of Montpelier, even the greater region of Central Vermont. Um, yeah, I just wanted to support and show my enthusiasm enthusiasm for this idea. That's all. Great. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Um, anyone on the screen that wants to talk, you can, if you know the raise hand function, you can use it. Otherwise, you can um, either just physically raise your hand or talk yourself off mute. Doesn't look like it. Oh, no, oh Beth. Beth. Got her hand raised. I, sorry, I meant to send this as an email to the board members earlier, but um, just having been a part of the middle school track team four years ago, which was the first year we started a track team, 24 kids. And then last year, well, we skipped a year for COVID. Then last year, there were 50 kids. I believe Nathan and his cohort of like amazing volunteer coaches at the middle school this year have 79 kids on the roster <laughs> for the middle school. Um, I don't know the numbers for the high school, but it just, it does seem to be a sport that brings people together. Um, I just remember from the time that I was helping to coach just the just the community that was built around that. Um, I see it with my younger daughter who's in fourth grade doing girls on the run. Um, it's just, you know, during a pandemic, during any time when you have a chance to be outside and be in community with people and be exercising, it's just like three magic things happening. Um, and aside from just the, it, I mean, so, it would be great to have it for our high school team and our middle school teams, but I feel like it is also a community resource that also brings people together. Um, and I, I look around at work at the high school and I look around at how many kids are on crutches at any given moment in the school. <laughs> I know when my son has been on crutches, uh, they've asked him to do physical therapy and like start to get back into, you know, being active and it's, you know, doing like running for, running for a hundred yards and then walking for a hundred yards and having a, you know, state of the art track is beneficial to those kids who seem to always suffer injuries as well as to adults and older people in the community, especially a community of baby boomers who are, you know, looking for a nice flat place to be out and be in community together. So just a few, a few thoughts. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Beth. Um, anyone else on the screen? Oh, Dan? Thanks. Dan Mojan, my player. I've been a coach for this school district for a while, um, from one manner or another, middle school mostly, but also in the high school. Um, I just want to be an, an advocate for track. Track is an amazing sport. It is a wide reaching uh, sport, and it's in how many kids can participate in it. Um, some people would call it the land of the misfit toys because all sorts of kids can come to it that aren't traditionally athletic and they might not be able to catch or throw, but they can throw a shot put 50 feet, right? Or they might be able to jump or they might be able to run real far, real fast. So it's a great sport for those kids that are not the traditional athletes to excel. So it's a fantastic sport for that. And the support of this track specifically, um, I think it's important to aim big. Uh, this, this is a, a generational 
uh, resource. You can think about this as a 50 year project. Um, we want this thing to be a success for not just the team of today, but those teams in the future. Um, so we're thinking six lane track with an eight lane home stretch. Uh, we we want to have it be metric in distance. Right now, our track right here is an English track. So it's a few feet short of a, of a metric 400 meter track. So in and of itself, it has to be a little larger. It's also very round. As it turns out, the straightaways are very short and the turns are, it's a very strange track. But I would just encourage the, uh, those that are doing the planning for this track um, to think about this as a, a larger project than just putting in a new surface and, you know, and that's it. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Great. Anyone else? No, thanks. I also want to note I got um, emails on this today as well, too. For who weren't able to weigh in. Um, uh, so next order of business is consent agenda. Um, we have a couple of things to add to the consent agenda, correct? Mm -hmm. um, we have a very exciting contract for the SPED director. Um, is that it? Is and Julie on your... Is... What did, did Anna send an email to add some things today? She may have. Julie's or Jill's got it. Okay, so what are the two items we're adding? We're adding the right off the hop across the rest of the board has not gotten this. Uh, uh, Peggy Sue Van Nostrom for the director of student services. Julie Conrad for middle school principal, Main Street Middle School principal. And then there, did you should have received some resignations and new and possibly a new hire, maybe. Um, Mia is raising her thumb. We're in hiring season, so it. Go, it <laughs> yes, and co-curriculars. Yep. Okay, we've got them. I don't know if I'm seeing the. Um, is the principal in the original document? No, it's in the last one that I have done. Oh. We'll have seen them because I'm not yet. So, uh, oh, I'm not seeing that. So maybe it's on a separate email. Amanda. <laughs> I just want to make sure that it's on here so that we're not missing this. Yeah, no, I did. I read it. Other people are seeing it as the, on the attachments. Which yeah. one? I didn't yeah. see the one. Oh, that's really. good. Right. Wait till mine fill it. Yep. No, I, I see it. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just I don't see it. What's, I don't the, what's the subject, Jim? It's, uh, it's, it's basically an update to the warning. But it's email. on that same thread, right? It's on the same thread. Facilities, energy. Yeah. yeah Co curriculars, new hire, resignation, new hire, email that interrupted my flow, KL resignation. So there's two new hires added Warren. this second. Yeah. And one of them is supposed to be the middle school principal, you're saying. Julie Conrad should be on there. For, the middle, for Main Street Middle School the principal. Sped director the is... SPED director would not have been because she accepted okay. literally 10 minutes before I the board see meeting. Helen, <laughs> Helen and Jen is what I see. Yep. I yep. know you're I think <clears throat> Okay. Yep. I, I'm sorry, but I don't see it. Okay. Do you want me to show you? Mia, do you want to? Libby, uh, I think what it is is that there isn't any attachment for Julie, but it doesn't look like there was an intended to be an attachment. We just have to. Oh, say out loud yeah you approve, approve the consent that. agenda that we're adding that into the consent agenda okay, thank you thank mia you. thank you <laughs> no problem thanks for clearing up Virginia that confusion gotcha. okay. so I mean, yeah, I read it. <laughs> um motion to approve the consent agenda with all those aforementioned documents so much a second i second any discussion 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, uh, Zach and Barrett, uh, student update. And I don't know if you probably want to do this with one, one here and one on Zoom, but um, I'll leave it to you guys. How I think we're going to do it is I'll, re or I'll like go over the slides that we have, and then Zach can add to anything after. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, then can we go to the next slide, please? Can you just tell me what to do? All righty. So, our agenda for this week is to go over some events that have been taking place in our community, and then we're then and then we're going to get into what me and Zach have been working on with an update about the MRPS vaccination grants, uh, giving some curriculum feedback, which uh, we got from students over the past two weeks. And then we're gonna talk a bit about the MHS parking situation. And then we're gonna talk about our next steps moving forward on these issues in particular. Okay. So as for some current events, um, this past week, Oliver the Musical was held. So congratulations to the MHS theater department for making that happen. And Zach yeah. is gonna give us a special honor. That was yeah. Your voice is incredible. So many great voices. I can't even believe it. Like, how did you get so many amazing singers? All righty. So um, on May 1st, the fourth annual Race Against Racism is happening. So I highly encourage members of the community and hopefully all the board members to show up if they can. And then here's some just other news that's been going on. So spring sports have started up. I would say, I think across the district and um, parent-teacher conferences happened last Friday, at least at MHS. I, I'm not sure about other schools. And also teen jazz is going to perform at MHS on April 11th. So also something to look out and come to. Okay. So a bit of an update on the MRPS vaccination grants. So at MHS, this is where we spent, or this is what we mainly have been focusing on. Uh, last Monday, students and staff were surveyed and asked how they would like to see the 8000 or so thousand dollars like distributed across the school. And they put all of their feedback in this large document. And since then, me and Zach have been organizing it and consolidating it into a few ideas that we think are both achievable and impactful uh, for the student body as a whole. So our main running idea so far is like a courtyard expansion, which is actually right outside, right outside here. So uh, perhaps sprucing the area up or just expanding it further that way. Because uh, from what we've heard from a lot of students is that the courtyard is one of their favorite areas in the whole school. So we think that giving it some more attention, maybe beautifying it would really benefit the, com the school community as a whole. Um, and to go about this, I've been in contact with Renee and Andrew LaRosa, as well as Tom Sabo, who I, I would say are all amicable to the idea, although Andrew can speak for himself if you like. <laughs> um, so me and Zach are going to continue to explore this possibility over the next few weeks and months and hopefully seeing how we can make it happen. So, but, but before even that, if that is the place we go through, another idea that we have heard on how to spend this money sort of ties in with the courtyard and that is perhaps more outdoor seating as well as uh, like a garden expansion which is separate from the courtyard itself uh, some other ideas that we heard that were popular among students included a lot of food related items like premium machines and coffee and, and things like that uh, we haven't been able to dive too deeply into that but we're hoping to meet with the food director very soon to talk more about that and then hopefully uh, narrow some of those ideas down into maybe more realistic and yeah. In the cafeteria? No, we don't really. None? We have <laughs> really? ketchup, but I don't think we have, I have not, I've had some salt. There's something that can be easily remedied. Like salt, like rose salt. Yeah. I, I feel like we can fix that pretty quickly without yeah. using any vaccine dollars. <laughs> yeah, so these are just some of the ideas that we've heard from the MH, MRPS or the MHS vaccination grant in particular, mm -hmm. but I think so far, we're kind of think we're leaning towards that courtyard expansion, but yeah. And then, so we weren't directly involved in the process at MSMS or UES regarding the vaccination grants, 
but we heard that students there were particularly interested in food items as well, like I think a snow cone machine or an ice cream machine as well, as well as maybe a gaga ball area or a, a seesaw, I think I heard. Yeah. yeah. Well, wow. So. Gaga ball. UBS wants the seesaw. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Although we weren't like particularly involved in that process, we're certainly willing to help out like with that. Okay. We can go to the next slide. So, um, both from our outreaches to students and just being generally like students ourselves, me and Zach can say I think that the vast majority of students feel that the current curriculum and the way that we are being taught could be improved. And we bring this up to the board because curriculum is what every student really has to go through throughout the entire school, through their entire school experience. And it has been a focus of the board, I would say, through like the interventionalist like learnings as we talked about at our last meeting. And there was a little bit more discussion around curriculum in general, like outside of our meeting. But, um, and I would also just like to make it clear that although we are not proposing that the board take any specific action on this, we think that it is important to show the board how students feel and welcome any of their support on this issue as we intend to make it a focus of ours uh, going forward. So this also goes for the parking issue that we're gonna talk about on the next slide. Yeah, so as for parking, uh, as we touched upon briefly at our last meeting, parking at MHS is a pretty inconvenient and just, I would say significant issue. Um, and the simple fact is there just aren't enough parking spots at the school and which has caused people to make their own spots like in the dirt or grass or park in handicap spots or just make their own spots which are not spots. So, and some people have also had to park over at the bank if I recall. So about a month ago, I brought this issue up to student council in an effort to hopefully find solutions to this. And since then we've met with uh, the principal Renee and Jen Wall and some of those solutions that we talked about included encouraging carpooling, instituting perhaps parking permits next year. And uh, as I talked with you Libby, perhaps opening up the Department of Labor parking area over that way. So, and this is something else that would be a much bigger discussion, but possibly a parking lot expansion, which would be a whole different ball game considering that the mud lot was just removed. So, yeah. but our plan moving forward, we just thought we'd let the board know, but our plan moving forward is to continue uh, following up about this and considering solutions with administration. And this is gonna be increasingly important, I think, to like students and staff over the next few years. So we're really hoping to meet with Jason, the Jason, like, and talk about this and other issues. Um, yeah, so for our future plans, uh, we can we plan to continue holding listening sessions and hoping to continue having a focus on student outreach. And on that note, we have a listening uh, session tentatively scheduled for next week at Main Street Middle School. And we're hoping to hold ones at UES and uh, Roxbury over the next few weeks. And we're gonna continue working to best distribute, distrib distribute and figure out how to distribute the MHS grant by meeting with administrators and just like coming up more of a like concrete action plan. Something else is we're also planning hopefully to meet with the, the new principal to like give us student perspective on issues that we find important and also just hoping that he is amicable to changes that we would like to see and students would like to see at MHS. And on the note, we intend to talk about curriculum with them. So I hope Jason is prepared for that. <laughs> yeah, as well as parking. Yeah. So yeah. And lastly, we're just going to continue focusing on what students want to see and hoping to institute those things. All right. Thank you. And if you have anything you'd like to comment about. Oh, and Zach, do um, you want to add anything? Yeah. yeah. I can also say. Um, on that listening session we held, I know last meeting we shared a lot of the like general feedback things. Um, and there were a lot of ideas that were out of budget that we have like marked out of budget, like parking was a huge thing. Um, like that necessarily can't be covered with $8,000. Um, so we're also planning on 
keeping those, all that feedback that we heard in mind and using that to um, sort of influence or guide like future decisions and like projects or planning. Um, because I know a lot of a lot of things like parking and curriculum um, are things that are really important to students and we, hopefully we can focus on them outside of like the lens of the ESSER, the grant money. Um, so yeah. Great questions. Do you have a sense of the um, the timeline? So, like for this eight thousand dollars, the timeline and sort of the decision making process. Take that. Um, I'm not totally clear on. I think we have to spend it by. Is it June first? June thirtieth. June thirtieth. So the money's for this year's students, right? Um, and I had to apply for it by April first. So it's all in. Uh, Jill, Briggs can't, Jill Campbell Briggs said today that there's a couple little snack foods at this, from the state side of, I didn't completely understand it, but so we're, they're essentially going to cut us a check for that. We just had to assert that we were at a certain percentage rate for each school building. And so that, that money, I think will show up in grants capable hands at one point. <laughs> and so all three Montreal buildings who qualified for the vaccine grant are all in the process that Merrick is talking about in different ways. Of course, the students are taking the lead here at MHS. There's been lots of surveying and conversations in um, pods at MSMS and classroom teachers have been doing a much more scaffolded discussion with kids at UES. So it'll be all spent by June 30th. And so, so students are the ones that are like leading oh, yeah. the charge here at the high school. Oh yeah. And, and so, Merrick, what do you think that the timeline will be on like making a final decision? Um, I think we hope to like make a final decision on how we would like to spend the money over the next, I would say two weeks. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, thank you for that presentation again, Merrick and Zach. <laughs> Could you let us know what time and day the listening session is at MSMS so that other board members could join you if we're available? Yeah. Or, or is it solely just for students? You really don't want any quote unquote grownups there. We, no, we would welcome board members there. Uh, it's not totally scheduled yet, but I will let you yep. know when it is. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, other, other questions? Yeah, I, so, I, we had a request uh, to table the Race Against Racism as a school board. So if, uh, if, I, if somebody wants to table that day, May 1st, uh, like we attended last year to have just a table with the school board materials. Um, so if anybody wants to, let me know so I can tell them. I'm not sure I'll be here May 1st, but... Mm -hmm. I don't think it's about our recent okay. I don't have it in front of me. So, and so this is one way to support. And then um, I think we also need to add like a listening session for Roxbury. I, I don't, I didn't think I, I saw it. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. I didn't see it. And then with the curriculum, um, um, it's very similar to the parents when we did the BIPOC and the disability and the LGBTQ. That kind of came out too, the curriculum piece. I, I wondered how, like, we just moved that conversation forward. I know that it's not part of the school board, but for for us to think, I'm particularly interested in the policy piece of the equity policy, how, like, we move forward that curriculum conversation. So I don't know, that's just a question that is coming to my head right now. And thank you so much oh, for all this. It's so beautiful. Do you want me to answer that correctly? Oh, I was more directing to towards Vivi around the curriculum piece and how you envision or not this group kind of think with you about those conversations or not. I would say I'm not prepared to answer that question. Either. Okay. I can I can say that um, how we thought about to move forward with the curriculum is just like talking with administrators and maybe the curriculum, certainly the curriculum director, just to 
like share how like share student feedback, our feedback, and then just hoping to work with them and that they are changes. Okay, great. Um, for the listening sessions, you're on the visioning committee. Did you have did you have some thought of combining any of the any sort of part of the the, the intention of the visioning committee? Um yeah. Because for sure. if you're you're there, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I've reached out to Beth about possibly getting in front of you know, getting some time with different classrooms at RBS. So if I hear from her, I'll I'll loop you in if you guys wanted to be part of that. I don't know how that would work. I don't know how it works for students to travel between schools during the school day. But we can get them a ride. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I yeah, it's not too much of a problem for me personally, but I don't, yeah. Yeah, well, just I hope that you, if you're keeping the vision, the intention of the vision committee in, in some of that that work in the listening session, yeah. that would be nice to combine it. And I would- I think that's a great idea. I would be happy to be there. I'm sure Nathan would wanna be looped in maybe. I don't know. However, we can work that out. Just keep us a surprise, uh, Brett. We can, get, we can get Zach and Merrick out there. If they want to go. Yeah, of <laughs> course. Great. Other questions? Yeah, thanks again, Zach and Merrick. They're fantastic. Uh, appreciate all the work put into it. Uh, the track. Um, so we have Andrew and Matt. <laughs> Andrew LaRosa and Matt Link, who has not graced the board a board meeting yeah. yet. So oh. this is Matt Link, who is our awesome athletic director. Awesome. I'll put you on the spot. I like to embarrass our guests sometimes. Okay. And Grant is here as well, if there's any questions around just the finances and the fund balance and what we want for reserves and all that kind of good stuff. So Andrew, you can talk about where we've been. Sure. And Matt, add that athletic lens to it too. So uh, this came about in that we talked about the track for, at this point, a couple of years and uh, wanted to, we needed to get a proof of concept going to make sure that we weren't promising things as things started to head towards normal again. And we knew the conversation was going, we thought it would be wise to do a quick study uh, to make sure that we could do what we were thinking, or we could do at least something out there. So we retained uh, Engineering Ventures to do that sort of 40,000 foot feasibility um, study. They came down, met with us, we kicked the dirt, they went back and did research on stormwater permits and sized, at least from aerial photos and scaled images, you know, what can we fit on there? Is there anything that's gonna stop us from doing something out there? And the report is included in here. And, and really the answer to that, thankfully, is no. You know, that certainly the idea of putting a paved track out there of some, some sort is a feasible project. So that's, that's really what this was to do so that we didn't go down the road and go, yeah, let's put a track and then find out we couldn't do it for stormwater or for anything else. There's, that doesn't mean that there isn't, as it sits, compromises or challenges to overcome as it sits. Um, the biggest piece is the urban soils that we don't know quite, we don't know yet, same, basically the same soils that we dealt with at the elementary school, that if we have to excavate, we have to place, we have to find a place to put them. And the only place we can put them is either in another urban setting and nobody wants our fill, uh, or up to Newport, or Derby, I guess, Newport, uh, ship it off site. That's, again, that's a detail. If we were going to head down the track route, that's just part of the cost and we have to deal with that. The other thing is the size and shape of it. Um, the, the track that we have out there is not, you know, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not terrible either. That um, their, one of their biggest concerns was, it's really our, our, not so much the shape because there's tracks in Vermont that are not the perfect shape with the perfect radiuses. Um, we talked with Bob Johnson, I right? talked to Bob Johnson over at the VPA to just confirm, you know, if the track isn't, you know, the textbook perfect shape, uh, is that okay? He said, yeah, the, the only thing is you can't state set state records on it and you can't hold state meets on it. A state meet would require an eight lane track and, you know, perfect proportions. 
Um, but as a, as a track you'd use and could use and invite other schools and, and run your meets, that's something that's not ideal, that's not perfect is acceptable. Uh, with regards to the, the, the shape and what we've got out there now, the, one of the biggest challenges is the meter on the outside lane for safety. Anybody that's walked on that track knows that we've got eight inches of a retaining wall between the track and the, the bike path on one end, and then we've got a retaining wall at the other end with the tennis court. We have not gone into any of that sort of detail of, okay, if we wanted to make it perfect, because when, if and when we get to that point, we will have everything surveyed and we will go down many different iterations and options and what ifs and you know that that's that's a long way down the goal of this was just if if we wanted to do a paved track out there uh, with, a, with a surface is it feasible and from this report the answer is yes i have a question about the the soils obviously that was a big issue mm -hmm. with the uas playground um, and obviously one of the factors is kind of the history of the site. It was, you know, was, there was there, fire, yeah. yeah, there was a fire, there was an old high school there. Do we know anything about the history of this site that would give us any indication one way or the other, whether or not there may be an issue? Has that been largely undeveloped? No, or? other than saying anything wrong, he, he knows more about this than I do. Other than there is in, in urban settings, there is a demarcation line. And I'm guessing that demarcation is from not from testing, but from the density of the residential properties. Yeah. So the entirety of downtown including this property is exactly. Right. So it's presumed that that and if we had soil, we could have taken the elementary school soil and put it over here because this area is designated. Okay. But it's Nothing, nothing of those red marks on the state map says it is dirty soil. It just says it's a potential. And if you have it, you can actually put it there. It's a, it's a management designation area. So it allows me to manage those soils on a specific way. But like a rural environment would not have that ability. So it actually provides a little more leeway. But there's nothing, there's nothing that says we, we don't know what's out there. Yeah, we we have there to wasn't like a old, you know, I don't think than... I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> I look around the room. I don't, yeah. I don't know anybody who know. We need Bill Bugby here for to yeah. tell us what was on the site before the school was built because he would know. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you want to speak to anything that you're thinking about with athletics? <clears throat> anything? Anything. <laughs> you can say anything. Uh, you know, for the track itself, I can't justify it any better than what obviously coaches and an athlete can do. They use it on a daily basis. And, and obviously they know what they need in order to like have their best experience here. I think a track would be unbelievable for all of our athletes. We have booming numbers. I mean, like we said, 79 kids at the middle school, give or take 30 um, at the high school. And then those numbers have only been increasing over the last five to six years, every single year. Um, so obviously having something like that for all of our students that would support over a hundred kids during the spring, tons of kids, obviously not, it wouldn't just be limited to track athletes or cross country athletes, either all of our athletes, they would go and run on it for time miles and things of that nature for training and, and conditioning for other sports. Um, you know, that type of stuff I think is, would be unbelievable to have for all the athletes. And obviously for us, I think it'd be great to be able to have that. Another might attract kids to come to our school, things of that nature. Um, you know, if we added other elements to it as well, I, I'm always going to talk about turf fields and things of nature and how beneficial they would be for us here. Um, we're, if you come here on any given April or May day, you'll see every single inch of green space here being used by all of our athletes. And eventually after a couple of weeks of rain, things of that nature, they're not green anymore. Um, so stuff like that, I think would be just enormous for us here if we were able to discuss things of that nature. Um, but as far as the track goes, the track obviously I think is, is a great resource for all of our athletes and students here, as well as the community. Excellent. Questions for Matt and Andrew and and Grant as well. Um, yes, that one. 
Mia? Um, thanks. Uh, most, for, well, first I wanted to just say thanks for the fees for engaging that firm to do the feasibility study because it was really, really, really <laughs> helpful to see that all in one place. Um, and I also wanted to just confirm what I just, as to have some context as part of this conversation and confirm what I think to be true is actually true that there's no money for the track in our current ESSER plan. It's also not in our current capital budget and we could use our fund balance for this. I think that might be a good question for Grant or I just see Libby nodding so that. Yeah, but Grant can speak to that too, yep. You're right, Mia. Yeah. Okay. Yes, to everything you said. And um, <clears throat> if it ends up being acted on with a motion and a second and a vote, the idea is to try to what we call commit money from the fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, and I would be for that. It may not be enough. It won't be enough, I guarantee, because we have about 1.5 million you could commit right now. And the actual cost is probably going to be a little more than that, but it, it would be a big chunk of it. Right. Um, that does two things. One, it does, it does kind of make this a priority and set that aside. But the other thing it does is there's been a lot of discussion at the agency and the legislature about looking at school districts fund balances. And if districts have a huge unreserved fund balance, you know, that could end up being a target at some point. So if you take this action and you commit 1.5 million for this, then that is a different kind of category in your audit. So it wouldn't be that you were having a two and a half million unreserved fund balance. You may end up showing 1.5 in committed fund balance for a specific purpose, mm -hmm. and then only a million dollars of unreserved. So it would be less of a target. Um, so I'm in favor of that. You right now, um, at the end of the year, I'm forecasting about um, $2.1 million of unreserved fund balance. And we wanna have like a 2% cushion. And so if you subtract that out, I'm looking at just over 1.6 million that's truly unreserved. And if you, so you would have the ability to, to commit 1.5 million and you'd still have some left plus the 2%. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I, I have some follow-ups, but I also don't, I can't tell if anyone else has their hand raised and I don't want to monopolize them. Yeah, go ahead, Mia. We'll okay. Uh, and then as far as sort of quote unquote big ticket items goes, one thing that had, I've heard in previous board meetings that would be another sort of facilities um, conversation is the the just to put it in a oversimplification the the net zero modifications or whatever to our buildings and so it feels like that's a thing that we as a board need to grapple with is yes we have this chunk of money that as you were just saying Grant you know is sitting there unused and not great that it's not used but we have to decide how to prioritize that and I'm just curious what the I don't know information is around I know there's a lot to, more to be talked about and just and like learned about on the more like facilities upgrade side of things but I don't know if that's all if that if things that are already planned for in the capital plan are part of that conversation I'm just trying to see where that all that fits in to the financial piece Yeah, well, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, yeah, that's okay. There's a, there's a lot of uncertainty on what we could actually do. Um, and what we had talked about was those things might be a good fit for if there's infrastructure money that ends up flowing, then we might be able to, that might be a whole nother bucket and something we could, we could use. But we need to do a lot of thinking about what's really feasible, especially with our, our space constraints outside. You know, like if we went with wood chips, you know, we would have to have a facility to be able to store those. I don't even know where we would do that. So there's, a, we're just in the beginning stages of thinking about what net zero projects we could even do. And we're already doing some things. I mean, uh, as part of the fund balance is talking about 
circulator pumps that have variable motors. So that saves, uh, saves energy. Heat pumps down at Roxbury is something that we're already putting money aside for. We did a lot of HVAC work here at, at the high school and all of that makes the air quality better, but it's also better equipment that's more energy efficient. So, right. you know, we're, we're doing a lot of those things, but as far as big projects go, you know, that's, that's a lot of homework that still needs to be done. And one of our schools is um, Union Elementary School is part of the district heat system. Right. And so that's already something that's in, in play. Uh, and every one of our schools is connected electricity wise to a solar farm. So we have solar already. So there's a lot, we, we just need to make sure we're publicizing what we're already doing. And then as far as any other big projects, we need to think about what, what, what's feasible and what's not. And right now, I think the bucket of money that we could apply to that is if we get any infrastructure money down the road. I see, okay. Uh, other questions? What about the windows? Where is that? The, so the windows for UES and MSMS is in the capital plan. And so um, you want to talk about where we yeah, are? Yeah, we here? actually did the facilities group and energy group did a tour over at Union and we talked, we shook, shook and opened a bunch of windows and I made them aware of some of the issues and challenges that we have and, and things that we need to take into consideration. And, and I don't think we're not in a position yet to say this is our solution, but we're in a much, I'm glad I've got a group of people who have now understand the things that I'm thinking about and we'll come together to make a decision and move that down. So that is the capital plan. Um, I think there is a, there's a work, we, we were going to get into it before COVID and then when that happened and you know, windows now, even if we said we want to do, we wanted to replace a window, windows are 18 weeks out for, for stuff. So I think we've got another summer of some more work. I think there's a, another variation of a rehabilitated window that we want to try, different weights, weight balance system and, and weather stripping system that we want to try. And also we've got some historic windows over there that we wouldn't replace anyway. So those might be a good candidate. So just to keep the ball rolling on that but um that part of the capital that's kept for the capital fund yeah but it's 1.5 million it's a different it's a different yeah. Yeah. Sure. so um it's kind of following up what you just said is um kind of a choice between the track or potential net zero projects with this funding like would there be any other? Right now, the fund balance, the amount that's available in fund balance is completely open to whatever the board decides. Right. But to um, so if, for example, like the board chooses to go with the track renovations, would it then make, would it then, would that basically kind of be it and there wouldn't be a way to no, look at? No, because projects? it's a, it's a board committed fund balance means it's the board that designated it that way. So the board could change their decision later, or they could add money, they could take money away and then commit it for something else. So this is, this is basically a placeholder that says the board has decided this is what they want to do with it, but later on they could change their mind and zero out the committed amount for the track and instead create a committed amount for a different project. So in the near term, it, it, it kind of, puts the, the fund balance in a different kind of bucket so that it's not a target to be looked at, but the board can change course later. Okay. They certainly would have to, if it is for the track, they would certainly probably have to add more committed fund balance in order to fully fund the track. But later on, if they decide, yeah, it because of soils issues or whatever, it, it's become too costly, we wanna do something else, the board can vote to uncommit that money and commit it towards something else. So it isn't, a, it isn't a, it's not unreversible. Okay. Just to follow up, is it feasible to do both like the track renovations or net zero projects? 
uh, I don't know what the net zero projects are right and the, yeah. and the timeline of them we, we just don't know enough about what those projects might be or what the community and board are looking for there um, and there are some legitimate choices that Andrew can probably speak a little bit more intelligently than I can about it that uh, there are some there were some suggestions around the zero energy work that would take field space away um, from the community and we just don't know we don't know what what that looks like and, and i'll speak quite frankly the, the if there is real desire to push that down we're going to have to spend real money on a real engineers to say you know what this is what we can do these are your options you know because we can talk about it and but we don't know if we do a, if we do a wood chip well we got to find a bunker we got to find a place to put it we got to find a boiler and if we decide we want to take away an athletic field or practice field to do that, well, that's a choice that has to be made. But the engineers will run the numbers and say, well, if you do a pellet system, we can store it underneath the building and you don't need to have that stuff. You don't need, you know, so there is a level of work that takes it. And the same thing at Main Street Middle School. There was talk of in the report, the net zero, the zero community report there, the idea of ground source heat. That, that was a neighborhood. There are culverts and pipes and you know that's a, a real engineering endeavor and you got urban soils <laughs> you know so it's like if we if there was ever a desire to really get our heads around what is possible that is a large large chunk of work that needs expertise well beyond the people well most of the people in this room <laughs> um because there are there are many options for any one of these buildings as to what we can do and they all they are they're all going to have compromises and, and challenges and and those sort of decisions of if it's we used to make these decisions based on economics you know we don't make those decisions on economics anymore that they don't pay for themselves and we've got really good well-serviced boilers that are underneath us yeah and they're, and they're going to serve us basically trouble fear for the next free for the next 20 years do we spend money to re let those sit idle while we replace it with a green solution or do we plan to let those work for the next 20 years and when they break down that's when we transition but those are quite th those are the kind of questions that that's a process that's a process. Yeah. And given what we know about biomass, is wood chips the green solution? Um, a lot of indication that it's not. We've got a we've got a, a group with the state that's got a smoke monitor on Main Street Middle School sniffing the air for wood smoke in town. You know, I think that's more residential stuff. But yeah, it's these are really, really big questions. Amanda. I I I keep thinking what uh our friend said about thinking of the track and like this 50 year plan of like the future generations that are going to access something like that in the same vein of the zero net zero proposal that the students have been advocating for so i'm thinking of like yes we want all to think of the future now all the kids that are going to benefit now but the, the future you know i you know i am a big proponent of thinking of track to also make sure that we have accessibility for our future kids that might be in a wheelchair or something, things like that, that cost a lot more too. And so I'm thinking with this money, is there a way to be able to commit both projects to the fund saying the board's committing to this too, to make sure that we have the, the, the plan to, to have the people, the experts that can give us what you just mentioned, the same with like a track that is a state of the art, increasing the, you know, whatever the language it is, track people, but being able to think through that, like being able to see this is how much it will cost. Thinking of capital funds, right? Like you need to, we need to raise $5 million by year 2027. And, and make that plan that way, I'm not sure. But I'm not sure if that is possible to commit ourselves to committing to these two projects until we have something more feasible that we can count on and say, oh, well, this track might not be here in the next 10 years or 
we're not gonna do, we're only gonna do this much of the net zero plan. I guess my offering is that like, let's commit to both things because it is important to both until we have the plan so that if the state wants to take our money, they can because we have already committed to this project until we know more. Yeah, um, my only concern there is there's already not enough to commit to do the, the full track that's, that's even estimated here, not to mention there's two pieces that are even missing. So we could commit 700,000 to it and know that we still have three times as much that we're gonna need and basically not be close to actually being able to do the track. Um, which, I mean, that, that's your, your decision. I mean, if, you, if you split it up and say, oh, we'll put 1 million and commit to the track, even though we know it's gonna be closer to two, and we're gonna put 500,000 towards net zero, even though we don't know what we would do, but we would hire a firm to start looking at it. I'm just concerned that we're not gonna do either. You know, we're not gonna actually make good progress on either. Um, but my big concern is that we commit money so that we don't have it taken away from us. So I would be in favor of this. And if you do change your mind later, like I said, you can vote to uncommit a portion or all of it and commit it towards something else. Um, I just don't know. I don't know whether that's a hundred thousand that we would try to commit towards net zero or a hundred million that we would put towards net zero. I, I just don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll echo a little bit of the sentiment. We've discussed it before at school board meetings that whenever these types of things come in front of me, and I think some of the rest of us start to dig a little deep around like, what are the values of this community? And how would, you know, what would be the will of the community? How would they want us to spend an extra $1.5 million or $2 million? Um, and I think, you know, it's hard when you only like it's, it feels to some people, and, and I understand why it's not this way, but that there's only a couple of options being presented when really it's like the world is our oyster. We could put $1.5 million into adding an addition for like a student lounge. You know, if, if that was the will of the community, that's what people wanted. Um, so I don't, I mean, and also like in the future, there will be more fund balance and there will be more budget cycles and there'll be more ways to ask the community for more money down the road. It might be a more appropriate time to really delve into the net zero thing. I think the like heating system isn't the only net zero ask either. I haven't, I haven't looked at all of the asks from the different um, committees that are really delving into that, but you know, you, you talked about like replacing lights and things like that. Like you can make other changes that really help get, it, get us towards net zero. A, a heating system would be a huge one, but also windows are a huge one and that is happening. So there's, there's stuff that we're doing as a district to move towards the net zero goals. Um, I don't know. So it's, so it's a struggle for me when I see a price tag this big to kind of uh, the weight of that to, to feel like, is this really the will of the community? One of the, um, my questions that I jotted down was if we look at it as just like, this is for this one sport, then it might not be as compelling as the way Matt, you started talking about all the variety of people that will use it. And I'm sure, you know, during the day, the gym classes will be using it. And um, so I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more towards like what is the variety of usage of a place like this? And I know like the soccer team plays on that field, the lacrosse team plays on that field. It's not just track kids that are using that space. I mean, the, the track itself is a big expense, but is this, does the price of this include um, the field too inside? So it's, Topsoil restoration, it's not that's, that's for what, what would we what we would potentially do, probably. If we were gonna do it right, we would include a drainage system at the inside perimeter of the track. And so it would be the repair. It's not new sod, it's we're not redoing the field, it would just be repair of the construction of the track. That field is actually in pretty good condition. 
and we have been working with uh, Chip Stevens over at, at Diamond Tech, and they've been coming in and helping us with aeration cycles and fertilization cycle and, and sand cycles to get it. So that field is in good condition. We're going to make it better, but no, there's no there's no need to like rebuild that field. But the lights are helping with other sports teams. The lights, I mean, the press box. yeah, the press box, um, the maintenance garage. These are things that extend well beyond just the track team. Yes. And I, I feel like that would be, um, you know, I think the community would want to hear about all the variety of uses and not feel like it just services the, the 80 kids or whoever are on the track team. Um, I mean, I think it's a very exciting project and I'm really enthusiastic about it and hopeful that you know, we would be able to get really high quality athletic facilities, you know, in this school district or the capital city. And I've talked before about it at the meetings that some, you know, I've traveled around the state and seen other facilities. And I feel a little like sad and embarrassed that our school district doesn't meet, you know, rise to the level of some of those other facilities. Um, so I'm excited by it. And then I also have this other feeling of like, okay, I want to hear from the community on this, just like we did with um, the ESSER funding and all of that, it's sort of like, what, what is the pulse of our community on this? Um, another question I had was sort of the timeline of the decision. So Grant, you're talking about wanting to commit amount of, an amount of money from the fund balance before it becomes a target. When would it become a target? What's the timeline of that? The end of the fiscal year. So okay. June 30th, if that's, if we have a $3 million of unreserved fund balance that shows up in our audit. Yeah. Um, you know, it, right now there's no real threat that that's going to be taken. It's just, it's not good practice to have that amount of money as unreserved. Um, so yeah. I would want to have some kind of action before June 30th so that we make that a, a little more realistic number. And and I don't know, you mentioned about the fund balance is going to go up. I mean, we've kind of gotten spoiled. It has gone up a lot over the past few years, but there's no guarantee of that. Right. Um, I am, you know, I'm getting ready to do a third quarter report pretty soon. So hopefully I'll have a better feel for this year, but um, I don't think it's going to be jumping like the past two years because of oddities related to the pandemic and other fund sources. So we'll see. Um, and if we did do something like sort of split and maybe not commit to the full, I mean, I see this as it sort of feels like an all or nothing project like if you're going to do the track you kind of got to do it like you were pointing out do do it once do it right and don't do it halfway half measures and all this stuff so it feels like this is sort of a you know it it is the price tag that it is and that we can't do like one million and then five years from now do another million right it's yeah, unfortunately no. it's an all or nothing thing and and the only question i had on that was like if we wanted to try to be creative and ask for bond money for some of this or for something, I mean, I just wanna know what the options are. The board certainly can. Uh, Jim and I have discussed that a bit. It's that I, I personally, my personal opinion, this opinion only, yeah. we have a large fund balance and we have lots of federal money coming into our district. It's Almost, a hard time it's a, it's a, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That'd be a hard ask, I think, for us mm -hmm. to make right now. And we, went, we went out with a big bond just a few years ago. Too. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Five, over $5 million bond. I mean, that could be, I think, an option for net zero after we, you know, kind Our of- boilers run their course and we're at that place where it's time- Or even like two money. years down the road when we've like spent some of the federal money, you know, we don't have the fund balance. You know, we've paid down the, the $5 million bond a little and, and it might feel a little, uh, and, and we figured out the net zero plan because right now we talk about a net zero plan, but but quite frankly, we, we, don't, have we don't have one. It's, <laughs> it's going to take us a while to figure out. And we don't even have a definition for net zero. Can I just clarify just yeah. to make sure that my proposal is that is that we put the commitment to do, be able to get to a plan where it says, here's the net zero project and this is how much it will cost. Here's the state of the art track and this is how much it will cost. And then you can revisit that. It's not to be like, we're gonna do this for 500 and this one for 500 and that. Mm -hmm. So the commitment is to, for us to be able to get 
to a point where we can be like, oh, this is going to cost us $5 million. And we only have 1.5 million for, you know, and then be able to then think through. For me, it's really hard to make decisions like this where I, like, where I don't have the number. So that's, that's just my brain. It's like, ah, sorry. I just want to clap. Um, I guess to piggyback on that, if um, the funds are committed, that's the language, is there a clock that starts at that point once they've been kind of earmarked for a particular project? Like that doesn't happen. No, There's no clock that starts. committed until it's either spent yep. or until the board uncommits the money Got it. and puts it towards something else. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so to piggyback on Emma um, and just thinking about access, I appreciated what our um, community member said that there is, you know, and I feel the same, there's something really appealing about track and field and that it is not uh, saddled with all the expensive gear and the stuff. It just feels like you need a pair of sneakers, <laughs> you know, and like some shorts and a t-shirt. And for that reason, it does feel really accessible. And I really appreciate that about um, track and field. And I'm also, I was thinking about just more per, like access, thinking about since it, it is such a big ticket item, you know, unified sports. I, I don't know, Matt, if you can speak to if there's a unified sports program here um, in Montpelier and how they would be able to access um, the track. Um, and then I also, and this is getting kind of granular, but I'm thinking about um, student transportation um, after athletics. Um, I could pick up a student in Roxbury, and this is more on game days, that wasn't able to participate in a, in a sport of choice because the student couldn't get home um, for lack of transportation. So I'm just curious where, what the district provides for students in after school hours transportation um, if they participate in after school activities, including athletics. I'm just going to add hold that because it's a different topic. Uh, so we're more than happy to talk about it at a different board, mem board meeting, but we're talking about whether to commit fund balance to a track right now. So it's a, it's a different topic. Okay, I'm just thinking about access down the line as we think about this, if this is going to be a $1.5 million expenditure, which is significant, just wanting to have an understanding of how our students across all demographics and all abilities are going to be able to access the, the program, the facility. So, um, uh, yeah, no, I, I wanted to make sure Mia, you got in the queue. Yep, um, thanks. Um, I think <clears throat> this is a question for Jim. Are we expecting to vote on this tonight? I was going to ask what the recommendation was in terms of action and what the timeline is, and also okay. what, you know, delay is delay. Um, the, I, I'm guessing that if we do move forward with this, there needs to be, a, you know, it's going to take a little while to, to make it happen. So, you know, what, what is the action window? Um, and if we miss that window, you know, what, what does that push the next window to? Well, can I, I want to follow up with what Amanda was saying was if this, this report is by no means the end of this, this to what I think Grant and the group is saying is, yeah, we're really interested in the track. Let's pursue it because the next step from this is going to be a design committee. That's going to talk with that which is gonna talk with the track people that really, okay, you know, what do we want here? How do we fit eight lanes here? How important is that? You know, there's gonna be these conversations about what it really looks like. Somebody's gotta decide what cushion, what track surface we're gonna, like, this is just as much as anything to me is, is the sort of, okay, this is a project we're interested in because we're, I don't, think that the next charge is okay let's just go get it let's go get a bid and because there's this is our opportunity to do it right so we're going to have to explore at least at some level what would it take to get eight lanes you know could could we get eight lanes in there and if we had to do that how's that going to face baseball so at least we've asked the questions and we've done some work so the sort of um this this is just the start if we go to a if we start if we want to do a track this is just the start and I think that as much as anything that this sort of commitment is just sort of, yes, we're really interested. So we should take a next step to find out. And if the next step says us that 
boy, an eight lane is really what a perfect eight lane track is really what we ought to do. And it costs X million dollars. And if we can't have it, it's not worth spending the money to do something different, you know? So I, I don't think that we're, we don't even really have a proposal. We, we've got a feasibility at this point. And this gets, at least gives us our heads around what it, at the very least, this is kind of like the least it's going to cost. Yeah. And that was before, you know, that report was written before our friends in Russia decided to, you know, so paving costs might have gone up by 30% by now on that. So this is the first real step towards anything. So I'd say the timeline as far as an action to commit is really back to the 6th, June 30th to get it committed before the end of the fiscal year. Although we won't spend a significant chunk of that money for a long time. What it does, committing some dollar amount does now give Andrew the ability to spend some money on engineering work so that we can move forward without having to spend general fund money. But it wouldn't be a huge amount of money that got spent out of this. Yeah, so what's so what's kind of the optimistic time frame in terms of how, like what time frame should you have our eye on in terms of, you know? Because I, I guess it depends on when you can come up with the other half million dollars. Because <laughs> that, that, that number there is to replace the footprint you've got, yep. do the retaining walls, the lights, but then also build a replacement for the storage because we're not going to drive on the new track and a press box and some of those other things. That 1.5 isn't going to cover that. You know that that this the the suggested the 1.5 that Grant's coming up with isn't going to isn't going to cover that. Correct. Um, I haven't been on this board for all that long, a little longer than say you, but I haven't heard as much enthusiasm for a project from community members as I've heard for this, and for any other reason. I mean, it seems like there are a lot of kids, there are a lot of families that really believe in this idea. Um, we've been working our butts off to try to reach out to the community for all kinds of reasons for months and months and months. And when we knock on people's door and we call them, we get we hear from them. But people are coming to us and saying, this is something that's really important for our community and for our kids. And I just want to I just want to recognize that 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 that's about as much as I've heard from the community, and and it's it's kind of straightforward. That's kind of nice too, you know what I mean? Like, um, it's a tangible thing that could be done. You know, it's not gonna transform our special education program because that's step by step. The net zero thing—that's a really step by step. I mean, the, the, a lot of these things that we're working on are really drawn out things that are gonna take a lot of investment and commitment and time and energy. This is kind of a, this is kind of a, to me, it's sort of a no brainer win for the community. We can deliver something that, that uh, that's just the way I see it. And I, that may be a shallow way of looking at it, but I think that this is the most that I've heard from our community members, unsolicited people sending us email, getting on our public comment, more than for any other topic. I don't think it's at the exclusion of our desire to be more energy efficient or at the exclusion of any of the other things that we know we need to do a lot of improvement on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would echo that too. I mean, with the caveat that I have a running family, so I, I hang out with a lot of people who, yeah, so. I don't know about bias. I just, I, yeah, you know, I hear about it all the time, but I also um, spend time with people who think about it all the time. Um, I also kind of feel that we have a, you know, a project that, you know, as you said, Andrew, there we need to nail some things down, but it, it is concrete. We are moving along. You know, and some of these other projects, while I'm very supportive of them, seem much more amorphous in terms of what we're even talking about, much less what what we could do. Um, I mean, I'm a I'm a big supporter of this project and a big supporter of moving it moving it quickly. But obviously, I want to make sure that the you know, consensus of the board is there too. If we were able to commit two million dollars to this, for, I mean, just as a hypothetical, then what is the timeline? Like, because I if, if you had all the money, if if we had all the money to pay for it, the numbers lined up. Yeah. I. I 
I don't see any reason why you couldn't we couldn't break ground next next spring. I mean, it's 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 a road. It's a road with drainage and, and a special surface on it. Is track season in spring? So we would want to like let them have their track season before breaking. Well, ground. you got a choice. You you let track season have their track, or you tell soccer they can't have their season. Somebody's somebody's got to give up something on some end. And at this point, Nathan and Dan can attest, and Megan probably around the the track team is already using other people's facilities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can't host track team. Right. And so what I understand about the six lane question, can you, you can host like smaller meets, but not a statewide meet. Is that what you're I saying? I wouldn't even, and, and you guys have been to more track meets than I, I mean, you go to, you go to Harwood, you're running on a six lane cinder track. You, I mean, talk about the tracks you go to. There's very few, you know, Burlington, St. Johnsbury just put in a nice, new. there's like very few, like, wow, this is a really nice track in the state of Vermont. There just isn't that many. I mean, six lanes is pretty average for what you see. U32 track is a six lane track. And then you just got to think about the numbers and how quickly you can get through events. So an eight lane track allows you to push through 15% you know, more kids in a given event. Um, yeah. Right. So just just you know we can't those of us on zoom can't hear what he's saying oh sorry <laughs> recap you can just, thank you man you can just run um you can run the, the events quicker you know some of the more popular laned events like the 100 the 200 the the 400 those are going to take forever a lot longer on a six lane track so you have to limit the amount of schools you can invite for a, a meet or that sort of thing. So you, you, an eight lane track allows you to, to have more participation, more uh, a bigger event. That's really what it gets down to. So the short answer is we yes, you can host meets on a six lane track. Yes. But you can host better, bigger meets yes. on an eight and, lane track. And the, faster. the really like the very popular timely events are like the 100 and the, the 100 and the 110 hurdles, which require that that the, the long stretch. You could make that portion of the track an eight lane track and then have six lanes for the rest of the track, which makes it so you can get through those very time consuming events quicker. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to kind of work it. And that was definitely brought up um, by Engineering Ventures and, and Bob that really an eight lane, 100 yard, 110, it's, it's, that's pretty critical. You, you really, you gotta do, you should really try to get that in if at all possible. I, I just want to remind the board that the, you're not designing a track tonight yeah. or agreeing to a track, right? You're you're deciding, or you could be deciding whether just to commit funds or not. Yeah. And even that commitment sounds fairly loose, and yes. we can back out of it pretty yes. easily if we decide to down the road after more investigation. Yes. Committing yeah. the funds gives us the direction to dig deeper, start getting people together to talk about what we want and what's feasible on the site that we have. And it's, it is very reversible, but just to be completely transparent, mm -hmm. if you do commit 1.5 and Andrew spends $20,000 in the next few weeks or whatever or months with an engineering firm, that money is, would yes. be gone, right. but, but not the big pot. I mean, that big pot wouldn't be, we wouldn't be looking at huge numbers until we were actually getting real close to doing the project. So it's, most of it, almost all of it would be reversible, except for whatever we actually spend between now and then to get prepped for. And do we have the ability to commit $2 million? You're giving, yes. You're giving, you're giving Grant a heart palpitation. Yes, I saw the skip of yeah. You you do. We would just have to go back. See, like a big chunk of what's setting aside as as kind of, it's not really committed, but it's it, we have. I have a set aside for yeah. some of this is like four hundred thousand dollars of fund balance is set aside as a potential revenue source in the FY twenty three budget. I wouldn't want to touch that because we're counting on that as a revenue in balancing the budget. But we do have money that we have set aside, thinking that we're going to have to do that in 24, 25, 26. And so there's, I mean, there's, we definitely could do 2 million, but we might have to go back and revisit, you know, in 24, are we going to, in FY24, are we going to have 150 for the fund balance as a revenue? 
if we can't afford it, we may have to take that off and say, mm, we're gonna have to do the budget without counting on that. So do we have $2 million? Yes, we do. We might just have to go back and revisit our thoughts on the next few budget years on whether we're gonna use that money as a, as a revenue source in future years. But we're pretty certain we can't do this project for 1.5 million. Correct. It's so, a good chunk of it though. And then if we, I mean, you, it's much more feasible, you know, a year or two, a year down the road to say, well, then let's budget for $300,000 as part of our general fund budget build. Um, than it is to say, let's try to find two and a half million dollars in the general fund budget. Um, and we can always, you know, the scope of the project is something else. Like we could say, we got enough to do the track. We don't have enough to do the, barn or whatever. It seems, it seems like the harder question is in October when we come back and tell you what the delta is, right? That's going to be the hard, that's probably going to be the harder question. Hopefully it's an easy question, but it potentially is a harder one than when we've gone back and we've tested the soils and we know what we've got for soils and we've had real conversations with the athletic director and the track people about, boy, that eight lane that those extra two lanes is going to cost another half million dollars, but boy, it opens up the world to us. Is that worth, you know, those are going to be, that's going to be the, that's going to be the harder thinking about, okay, is the track worth it to us? Yeah. And where do we find that? And where do we find that delta? And how do we justify that delta? Right. Yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> I wanted to chip in and say, I too am in favor of this, uh, of making the commitment um, partially as, as an individual who did participate in track and field in high school and very much, very much benefited. I could probably take up the whole rest of the board meeting telling you all about that if you really wanted to hear it, <laughs> but it is very near and dear to my heart. And it's, you know, that's, as a board member, I also have to set that aside and listen to what we're hearing from the community. I... We we had a student presentation on this. Um, I, I feel like it's helpful to bring that back up into this conversation since we've had this conversation in pieces over the course of several board meetings. But we did also have a student uh, the student presentation on this, which was also um, incredibly passionate and very well thought out. And we have heard from many members of the community. We have also heard from members of the community who say, "Why would you?" in your right mind, spend that kind of money on a track and field. So there has, the, the conversation has been happening. Um, in the end, after hearing all of those points of view, I, um, I fall on the side of, I think we should make this investment. Um, when it comes to what is the Delta, I also still feel like because we have such a great amount of community support for this, if the district were to say, we're ready to commit 1.5 million and the Delta ends up being, I don't know, X amount of money, I really would still like to see some sort of collaboration where we've got fundraisers and sponsorships that are that is the community is also coming together around that. So we find some creative ways to meet the full cost of this. Um, because as so many people have pointed out, this is not just going to be a resource for 80 high school students. This is going to be a resource for our whole community. And it feels like our entire community could, could make, be part of making that investment. That's not any conversation I think we need to have tonight. I just think if, if really the question is tonight, the board making that commitment of 1.5 million out of our fund balance that could be changed in, in either direction, further on down the line, once we know more, I'm in favor of that. I have one other clarifying question for probably for Grant and Andrew, which is what I've been hearing you say over the course of this conversation tonight is doing such a thing like committing the 1.5 million doesn't necessarily take any kind of net zero ideas. I also recognize we have no plan or it, you know, facility and adjustments to increase efficiencies that are not yet, that the district is not yet doing. It doesn't take them off the table because there are other ways we could fund those when we come up with those ideas and when we have the feasibility around those. Is that correct? Is Am I hearing you correctly? This, this, you are absolutely correct. And 
to let you know, we're spending nearly three hundred thousand dollars on building systems improvements this year between right. Roxbury right. and and the high school alone. So I think we've and and we had an energy group. You know, we reduced our energy consumption of electrical use by forty percent in the last fifteen years. I mean, we're 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 chugging along. We're chugging along. We got electric vehicles. So yeah. So, yeah, would you like to make a motion to do just that? Uh, sure. I move to commit $1.5 million of fund balance to, um, to, to track and field improvements. Okay. Discussion? I feel a little like rushed in my personal vote on this. Um, and I agree that we've heard a lot from the community over a long period of time. So, but I just, I, I guess I just wasn't prepared. I didn't realize that tonight was the night that we were like making a decision to commit the funds. And I guess I would love to push it off one more meeting and just make a community plea. Like I, I would like to hear, you know, anyone who's listening, <laughs> anyone who's watching our, our channel um, to just, you know, this is your opportunity to weigh in if you haven't already before we make a vote. I mean, that's 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 how I feel about it. And I'm supportive. I, I, I also don't feel comfortable voting today and I support it. My, my kid is on kid, you know, girls on the run. I'm training for a marathon and I'm horrible at it. I love running. I think it saves many people's lives to find that beautiful sport. And I also have heard from the students around net zero and that's like something that I don't wanna have to compete. Like, I don't want this to be about like this 1.5 million. And then because the students also for the past two years have come here to advocate. And I don't feel like we have enough answers for them, even though we're doing all this work. It's like, again, it's going back to like this repeat. And I would like to think a little more about it's not it either or is like, how do, how do we decide on commitment of this magnitude and uh, making a plea for people that might have a different point of view. So that's, Again, I support the students, I support new things, but I don't want to be put on the spot to decide here. Um, well, I try to run as little as possible. <laughs> but I'm for the track, I think it's a good idea. And I also feel like the net zero process in general is is a way of life. It's iterative. It's something that you 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 take into account whenever you make a big purchase, whenever something dies, whenever you're looking for big improvements. So I feel like it's not an either or. Um, but also, I feel like there's no harm in waiting another two weeks. It's a it's a lot of money. And if you know we're gonna give the community one you know last call, I feel like that's fair. Um, yeah, and our our next meeting is one week. Oh, one week. Okay. Um, that's cool. Oh, yeah. I just want to say that as a track and field runner, I, I do support the track upgrades and renovations. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't think that there's going to be like a, a new proposal for net zero or really probably any other project between now and next week when there will be a vote. So I don't necessarily see too much point in delaying the vote, but because it can be reversed either way, but um, yeah. Anyone else? Zach. Zach, oh, sorry. It's all good. Um, I think I also agree with Merrick. I definitely think um, it does feel, I understand um, sort of the suddenness of the decision, but um, I think what's been emphasized that it's like, that it is reversible and sort of that it's not like a, we're not spending $1.5 million right now. I think 
even like getting a better picture of like if we have if we commit that money and then we like find out how much the track is going to be and we compare that um to sort of other situations like i feel like that um could be incredibly useful and i just know i <laughs> i got I think like three different emails today um, from community members sort of about the track and we've heard from a lot of people um, about how important it is to them. The track was something that was brought up at that very first like listening session in the library at the beginning of the year. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very pro uh, like eco-friendly decisions and sort of assessing that. But I think if we can start the groundwork of sort of assessing what is going on with the track in terms of like how much that would cost, all the like con considerations, like we can even input sort of like net zero thoughts into that. Like we we're talking about wood chips being more eco-friendly. Like, I feel like I agree in the fact that I feel like I don't think any like new big proposals of that would be like $1.5 million worth um, would come up in the next two weeks, but I might be wrong. I don't know. Another um, consideration why I would want it to be on the next meeting agenda is that the way that it's written on this agenda, it says track considerations preliminary planning report, Andrew LaRosa and Matt Link. And then we have a feasibility study. So I, you know, like if, if me as a board member, if I didn't realize we were planning to vote on this tonight to commit one and a half to $2 million. I mean, I, the reason why I asked the question is I'm actually sort of more in support of committing more money because I think that we should commit as much money as we can to make sure that we actually get the project done. So I'm supportive of it. I just want, you know, our community to not feel blindsided by a decision of that they're going to perceive as a big decision. I'm con I, I think I'm confused because my agenda says potential board action commit 1.5 million of fund balance for renovation of the track. Oh, is that updated? Brett's on this one. And this is what's posted to our website. The website. So this is what I got. In the it may, packet. yeah, it may have been a and snafu. So, that that may be the reason why no. it may have been a snafu with what with what y'all got in your board yeah. packet, which I, which I apologize for. I don't know how that happened. But that's what the public had access to. Yes, yeah, because there's public to people on the. Yeah. Um, the so, again. Yeah. Valentine oh, yeah. Smith. Has yeah, I think we're. Hi, I'm Valentine. Some of you know me um, from the bridge, but I'm a Montpelier resident and my son is a Main Street Middle School student. So basically, the bridge is what got me to attend these meetings that impact really everyone in our community. And since I've been focusing a lot on the budget, that's how I've learned about through your website um, and through these meetings. That's how I find out about the um, community feedback. And what's coming up for me while I'm listening to this is that report, which is on the website that expounds upon what's being done with the ex ESSER decision. So some of the feedback in that summary is speaking about the outdoor spaces and then you go down a bit, not too far down, and net zero will come up as a prominent theme. But I did want to share that uh, as a parent, my son was a virtual learner last year, uh, very little movement, and he was able to join the cross country that, you know, running after school for accessibility reasons. I don't have a car, he's able to run to Hubbard and it helped him get back into shape after basically a year and a half of sitting all the time being on the computer. And I would say that that just my two cents as a community member with that insight, 
but whatever happens, I would say take a little time since there are emergent issues that are still being considered like accessibility and funding and whatnot. But um, it would be great alongside that to know the specifics of what net zero modifications would entail. So thank you for listening. Um, so we have a motion for action. We've had a couple of people express they'd like it pushed off. The public does know there was potential action. Unfortunately, that thing we got. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do, I have to be honest. I think we've had a lot of community feedback. This has been a topic that's been discussed for several months. Um, I don't think we're gonna get significant new information from the community in a week. I don't think we're gonna get significant new information on what net zero looks like in a week. Um, I feel the majority of the board supports doing this. Um, I would certainly entertain a motion to remove that motion, but I'm I kind of my instinct would be to go forward with a vote. So I'm going to call a vote in just a second, unless someone removes that motion. Hey, maybe this is a question for our parliamentarian, but yeah. isn't it technically just tabling the motion instead of getting rid of it altogether? I, I think yes, I think you can table the motion. Okay. As the as the um, author of the motion, I don't have a problem with it being voted on next week instead of tonight. Um, I I understand that you know this is something that the community saw as you know we that we would be voting, um, but that I I also was a little surprised like that that wasn't what I saw either. And so even though I made the motion mostly to start the ball rolling, not necessarily. You know, I, I'm okay with us waiting one week. I think it's helpful for people who, for a big decision, for people to give give people a chance to just think on it. People meaning board members. So, would you like to table your motion? I'm, I'm happy to vote on it next week, too. I think I will put it as the first item, um, unless people object. Because if there's new information, we can discuss it, and if not, we can can just move forward with a quick vote based on this discussion. So you want to table your motion, Mia? Sure, I'd, we I'd table it. it. But, okay, um, we will vote next week then. Thank you. Thank you um, and thank you so much uh, for all the work on this. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks for the, the community engagement. Mr. Suter. Uh, Jim, just before we leave, just one thing just to clarify. We have about 2.1 million available. I said 1.5 because we have this target of trying to make sure we have 2% that we're sitting on at any time. So if you did 1.5 and if the cost was 2 million, you could always use some of that other amount. It just eats into that 2%. So there is more money available. So when you said, do we have 2 million? Yes, we do. We might just have to chip into that. And I do want to apologize to the board. The, the agenda that is up on our website that the community can see does say potential action commit 1.5. What must have happened is Anna must have downloaded a draft. A draft yeah. yeah. And yeah. that got into your board packet. So I apologize for that. That's that's our fault. No worries. Good evening. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is yeah, Nathan. No, thanks, thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, my name is Nathan Suter. I'm here in my role as a consultant and the facilitator for the district wide visioning process that the board initiated uh, probably in September or something. Um, and I'm here to report to you and take questions. And I'm happy to just sort of plow ahead and report or uh, take questions and respond to questions as you wish. What would you prefer? Please report. Yeah, it's a quick report. I was just on kind of where things are. Um, okay. would be great. And then just kind of any questions. And um, yeah, I think the main purpose is just to kind of 
you know keep us keep us apprised of of how things are going and if you know we need any adjustments or at least what's uh, on adjustments so uh first i want to thank Rhett and Seiji and Amanda, who uh, Amanda has stepped aside from her role in the committee and Seiji has taken that board seat, but uh, these are the board reps, along with Merrick, who, when he joined the committee was not on the board, but so we now you have three board members present on this visioning committee, uh, which I think is functioning quite well, we have held. Four meetings. Uh, we missed a meeting this past Monday because I was ill, so I apologize for that. Um, but we've held four meetings where we have described or discussed the scope of inquiry, which is essentially me uh, proposing and, and then asking for feedback from the committee on, are these the areas we want to investigate and we want to, for, for, on which we wish to get feedback from the community? Um, and then we have moved from that to drafting a survey, which is one of the foundation pieces of the work we're doing, but also describing other instruments or channels through which we'll get information and feedback from the community. So right now those will include a survey, which is both online and in print form. Uh, it will include listening sessions and then it'll include community gatherings that are more formal and more designed. Uh, we may use the My Thought exchange tool that the district has in its toolbox. Uh, I have some questions about that. We didn't get to discuss that at the Monday meeting. Um, and then each, so the, the committee is made up of board members, uh, faculty, staff, community members, and then students. And we have, we initially had, I think, eight students on the committee. We've had uh, one student resign, uh, but it's still, good representation from the student body those folks have volunteered to um, work on the survey hold listening sessions and engage with their not only their peers but also younger grades because all the students on the committee are high school age at this point um, similarly uh, teachers and staff have offered to be conduits to their constituents their direct constituents and we got to the point where uh, about 10 days ago, we had a survey that uh, was ready to go for the public and we've started to circulate that. Our intent was that this Monday, we would look at the returns from that so far, um, revisit the survey process and, also, and then start to launch these other uh, methods of engaging with the community. Uh, we didn't have that meeting, but I think we will still be able to move forward with a number of those uh, those channels. Um, so far, we have 71 responses to our survey, which I think is a good start in, in just over a week. Um, they are skewed in some ways that I think are not surprising, but also map out for us the direction that, where we need to do more uh, proactive outreach. So for example, um, only four of the respondents are from our residents of Roxbury out of 71. So Rhett and Dottie and Amira and myself are working to expand our outreach in Roxbury, including Rhett, who's going to hang out at the Roxbury Country Store tomorrow evening or uh, Friday evening and hand out paper surveys and, and get feedback. Um, we also have for example, a lot of survey respondents who report their highest level of academic or highest level of education achieved as a master's degree or greater. And uh, while that's great, it's probably not representative of our community. And so we just, I feel as though that is a demographic who is likely to have access to a survey like this, the time to respond to it and, um, to do so. And so our work is then to deepen our engagement with folks who may find this not as easy to engage with and figure out how to do that better. Um, I loved what I was hearing earlier this evening, especially from Emma uh, and also from Amanda with regard to the question about the reserve fund and uh, committing funds for anything in a district where Emma was saying, 
I'd really like to know what the, the values of our community are. And so this process is attempting to define those, to both define a, a shared vision within the district and to define a shared set of values, because I think in your role as, as a board and in Libby's role in her team as education leaders, you face questions like this all the time. And it will be useful to have uh, have that much better defined so that there's it's less in question whenever the next opportunity comes in front of you. So that's, uh, that's broadly uh, our goal and my goal. Um, the, a, couple, a number of questions have come up from within the committee and a few from uh, board members or members of the public that I just wanna name. Um, not least is the question of what does our final product from this committee look like as it would be presented to the board? Um, I entered the process feeling comfortable with that not being terribly well defined and waiting to see what we hear from the community and then decide as a, as a committee how we best shape that information and present it to the board in a way that's useful. Um, it, it may be important to do a little bit more designing of that final product as a committee earlier in the process partly because other members of the committee, I think, uh, will be helped in determining what steps we should take by understanding or having a clear picture of what we would present to the board. Uh, we haven't discussed this uh, completely as a committee, but my answer to that would be that I would like our committee to present the board with a draft vision for the district, which may be sort of several several short paragraphs. Uh, it could be very, very concise. Uh, and then a draft of the district's values. Both of these are, you know, we as a committee are functioning as the listening post and as doing our best to interpret what we're hearing, but not distort what we're hearing and then present to you a synthesized and distilled version of what we've heard. And then part of the part of this contract is for me and hopefully members of the committee to work with the board once that has been submitted to, as you all interpret what you're hearing, perhaps massage those statements and then seek to apply that or think about how you apply that to policy. So that's what I look for in terms of the, the output. And then part of our process also will be to be transparent all the way through so that as soon as we have data from the survey to share, that's visible to the public. And when we present the board with a draft of vision and values for the district, we're also presenting the supporting information that, you know, from which we made that. Um, some of the inter interesting things that I anticipate are that we're gathering information from a survey, much of which is very quantifiable, right? We can say 70 people, think this, or they stated that this is their, their most important value. Uh, we will also be getting free answer data from the survey, which is not as quantifiable, but still really useful in terms of nuance. We'll also be getting information from listening sessions. We'll be getting information from community gatherings and figuring out how to make all of that visible, weight it appropriately, um, and present it to you so that you have all the information, if, uh, you know, um, for example, the idea that, so that the two most supported values in the survey so far are transparency and then empathy and kindness. And so that's nice quantifiable information, sort of strong numbers responding to those values. There are other values that are decently well represented and there may be evidence within the narrative responses that support some of those um, less well represented values. And so then there'll be a discussion within the committee and then within the board about how much do you weight those responses as you shape your policy. Uh, the other big question that I think, well, uh, there's, a, there's a minor question, which I wanna not forget. And that is that we did have one student step off the committee and uh, the board's approach when the students first petitioned to be part of the committee was to make sure there were enough seats for every student who was interested in participating. 
uh, I'm open to reopening that front door and using school channels, offering again to the student body that there, you know, we have one space or more spaces on the committee, if that's something that's interesting to the board. I think we can accommodate that as a committee in terms of bringing someone up to speed. Um, you don't necessarily have to make a decision on that tonight, but I want to uh, foreground that as a uh, question. And then a much bigger question is that the, uh, the timing of our process is tight and it is constrained by various realities of a large representative com uh, committee and other realities of life. And more than one of our committee members has said, uh, I'm not sure that we have enough time to do this inquiry justice. Can we extend the time period for public engagement? How might we do that? And um, we've heard, I think, really articulate voices from multiple sides of that question. One of which is, yes, it would be better if we had more time. Another, which is the board may only have certain periods of its sort of annual schedule when it's really able to incorporate and act on the information from this committee. Um, so I'm uh, speaking for myself as the consultant involved, I'm open to reimagining the timeline for this process in a way that is um, that gives us more time to do as deep public engagement as we would like to do. Uh, the, the implication when we were negotiating uh, how to do this project was that that was in tension with and a trade-off against time that the board would have working with me as a consultant and with the results of this uh, community engagement. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily true if we if we simply sort of sleep the project for a period of the summer, or if we, you know, I think what I would be listening for from the board is whether you all think you have the capacity to engage the outcome, the, the product of this process a little bit later in the calendar year and still make those results productive to your work. Um, I feel like my time can be, I'm flexible in terms of how, how I apply my time uh, Sort of within the within the current contract, where we can discuss uh, discuss other things. Just want to grant that that's you didn't hear that until just now. I don't necessarily expect a response tonight, but I it's I feel like it's important for me to honor some of the concerns raised by the committee and make sure that you're aware of those things. Uh, and now I'll stop talking and take questions. Questions and uh, for further elaboration from. Board members have been on the committee, right? Well, uh, one of the things that some of the folks on the committee feel that this is a, a really, really important effort and that it takes a lot of time to reach out. I do think there is a little bit of um, a sort of uh, maybe not absolute clarity among the people on the committee as to whether the committee is going to decide what the vision is for the board. And that's different than that puts pressure on the committee members to get the work done faster and it feels rushed. And if that's people's sense, I think if there is this idea that the amount of time that we have to reach out to the community gets a little bit extended, and then the committee makes some loose recommendations that are reviewed by the board maybe over the summer, and then it goes and then it's sort of the board has plans to have a vision by the beginning of school or something like that, that the committee would then be allowed to have some feedback on or something because folks want to have, they have ownership over this effort. That might help ease some of the pressure, I think, that some of the committee members are feeling, I think, because it is it is a big project. And to think that we're going to come up with a, with a with a product by like the end of June, is really unreasonable. And I think it, it's causing people to feel anxiety that's maybe unnecessary. Hey, Bar? Just mirroring that, like I agree. Um, as we've gone through this process, I think it's pretty clear that uh, some more time for this visioning process would be really helpful to get the quality result that the board really wants to see. And I assume the community wants to see as a result. So, I just, yeah. Amanda? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the the 
the conversations about what we're going to do as a board, you know, when we're thinking about our work plan for next year and what we're supposed to be working on. And part of this move has always been to hear from the community uh, and be able to be informed about what, what, what are people thinking, um, where they want to see things going, what are the challenges that people are facing, what are the successes that people are leaving, that suit, and, you know, like, so I think, you know, like that was, has been kind of some of the push with the listening sessions that we were doing that we're now, you know, stopping until this process is done, but that it's really easy to hear from communities in one specific subject, like whether it's the truck or like what people are passionate about, right? Like that is easy when we have, but the general thing is what informs our work per se. Uh, when we're thinking of budget, when we're thinking, you know, like, and so I think that is work that we can have in, in terms of that transparency around like, this is what the survey results are because we do need something to guide us too if we are going to meet as we should to plan a work plan for the year ahead, right? Just like I'm thinking over what we can do as a board too with the information you compile in, just like we have certain things that we've compiled for the ESSER fund and just kind of being able to see the big picture. Are with the, your, the board's annual schedule, when do you compose the work plan? Oh, okay. <laughs> Future goal. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sure. um, does, does anyone have an issue with allowing the timeline to be reimagined slash extended? Is I, Emma? Um, I don't have an issue with it at all. I think it's, you know, we're hearing from the people that are actually doing the work yeah, saying, you know, we, this is what we feel is the right thing to do. Um, I do have a question about it, uh, just logistically about the students. So now there's step seven students on the board or on the committee, sorry. Um, would they, you know, what would that look like? Would we just sort of have a, a, a and I like the idea of, of filling that spot that's now been vacated. And potentially if some of the students are seniors, if they graduate or if they're not willing to commit into next school year, because we did propose it with a certain timeline involved. So some of the committee members will likely not be able to um, continue to commit their time beyond what they've already said that they would. When that happens, will we be able to fill those seats or does it make sense to fill the seats or just continue on with a, a more skeleton crew? <laughs> Uh, I love that question. I was, I was already thinking about the students. I don't actually know the grade level of each student. So that's a question I'll check in with Merrick in a second. Um, I think that I, I had not thought about sort of how long the committee would stick on, you know, stay together for this. Part of, part of my idea about the committee is that as we do this work together, the members of the committee, even individually in the future, will will hopefully have those tools and continue to be involved in the district, um, though it does not have to be composed as such. Um, I can imagine sort of after there's a product from the committee for the board that from my perspective, the plan A is the committee is then sort of off the hook and can inform future discussions, but it's not expected. However, we could reimagine that as um, you know, the board does some work or we do some, I do some work with the board and then we come back to the committee sort of as a check-in, you know, is that, uh, we've thought this through some further and here are some concrete implications. Does that resonate and does that fit with what you as the, the, uh, the listening post for the district were hearing? So I can imagine that as well. Uh, I do think your, your point about, you know, we advertised a, a timeline to the committee which basically includes meetings through June, you know, if necessary. And uh, it might be disorienting to change that. Well, so good question. Yeah, we, uh, part of the design is that we offer committee members 
stipends for every meeting. Um, because the timeline shrunk a little bit, we had we were not budgeted to spend quite as much on committee stipends. We also have uh, have had relatively few committee members submit W nines. So right now there are very few committee members getting stipends compared to those who are eligible to do so. Um, to me, that doesn't yet feel like the most critical piece. Or if it became critical, I could come back to you all and say. It would be really helpful to have three more meetings with the committee. Here's the price tag if we continue as you know with this design. Um, so that's a little bit of a bounce back question to you all. You know, we also we have budgeted for 175 ten dollar gift cards, and of the 71 people who filled in surveys, only nine have sort of clicked through to the next thing and said yes, please send me a gift certificate to our pond books. So, you know, it, there's some variability and we'll see. I'm not yet, that is not yet a pressing concern. I also want to thank you, Nathan, for just being flexible to being open to the feedback that you're hearing from committee members and being willing to sort of change your game plan as the facilitator. Um, I'll just offer, like, I like the, I like the creative thinking involved with like maybe putting it to sleep or, or paring it down over the summer you know, whatever would make sense for the committee members, whatever they would want to do, um, I would be supportive of. I, I will just put it out there that when I worked with um, the facilitators with the School Safety and Police Relations Committee, they also kind of got creative around their work as the facilitators and, and released some of the meetings to me as a facilitator, you know, for like if there was, there could be a potential there um, to be respectful of the contract that we signed with you to give some sort of like summer homework or something like that to the committee members. Uh, and I also really like, Rhett, what you said about sort of doing a check-in um, maybe in June when the original timeline, maybe, maybe the bullet point values, and then maybe the future work is the drafting of the actual language. Um, but I think you're all on the right track and I'm totally supportive of allocating more funds <laughs> to be able to pay those stipends for some additional meetings or whatever it takes to, to kind of make, have everybody feel like they're doing it with fidelity. I just, I, I forgot to make one other response to your question about the committee's continuation. I think in a certain point, not too long from now, it'll be more and more difficult to bring somebody new onto the committee mid process, having, you know, there are just a bunch of discussions we've already had that have been I think really meaningful and that we all carry with us as we're moving forward in this process. So I think there will be a sort of a point of no return, but I think we can hold that in our minds as we make that deci these decisions. Sure. Okay, so just to clarify, there's only one senior student on the visioning committee. So I'm not totally sure that if this were to be extended that it would be too much of an issue like resignations or whatnot. Even if it is, I think that's kind of something that we can come to as we, as it happens. I'm not sure if there has to be like a plan in place, but I do think that um, I don't know if it would be really necessary to replace any members lost anyway, because by the time that there would potentially be resignations, the process would probably be winding down anyway. So I'm not sure. Yeah, it's like necessary to sort of pace the work and time it to a point where if you were to be drafting the paragraph vision statements, you know, that could kind of be seen as like a natural break yeah. in the work where if people needed to step away because of that original timeline that was proposed, that that would be a natural time to do it. And I think right now, or like over the next, however long, when we're continuing with our outreach to members of the community, I think that's when having, you know, as many members as there currently are. I think yeah. that's when they're gonna be most helpful, but as it's winding down, I, I'm not sure that it'll be super necessary to, I don't know if everyone's gonna still be as necessary, not that they're not any less necessary, but yeah. So, so it's like, oh. Uh, just like for the timeline, I think like one of the things that we talked about in one of our meetings was like 
budget season, right? Like how do we push forward? And this year we started late around that process of input. And, and like, so I think for me, this process to inform some of that, I wanna just get clarity on that, on when we start thinking about that process, the budget season, one. So this is just for me. And two, I'm now, my, my mind is now muddy around the whole purpose. <laughs> which has always been muddy in terms of like, are we doing this for Roxbury? Are we doing this for the buildings? Are we now just narrowing down to the vision and mission? Uh, so that kind of is marking up for me right at this moment. Uh, you okay if I respond to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda, I think that the last, your last point is excellent. Uh, the, let's see. The RFP names in the RFP to which I responded that there's a one of the questions is, you know, uh, what educational experience should a student expect in Union Elementary versus Roxbury Elementary or something? I'm not, I don't have it right open in front of me. Um, so that was, there was a pin in that right from the start. Uh, but also a question about district provided vision which does point, you know, the the two different elementary schools questions would point backwards towards vision and values. Um, so the the process I've tried to design so far holds space for questions about um, facilities and how the, you know, what the what the community's expectations are for the educational experience of a student, sort of regardless of building or in. Uh, you know, it's, and I think that um, I'm trying to keep the process such that we we don't get drawn too deeply into the weeds of, um, you know, somebody comes to a meeting and says, <laughs> when are we going to get a track? We need a track. Why don't we have a track? And then the whole meeting goes down the discussion of whether we should have a track. We need to keep it at a you know certain elevation where it's as well. Uh, if we have a commitment to serving the extra extracurricular interests of our students, is a track you know then the board or the administration can make a decision about whether a track is a priority. If we have a commitment to um, these five things for elementary education. And we happen to have two buildings and two populations. What does that mean for those populations? So there's there's a little bit of gray area, but I, I see part of my role and part of our committee role as um, holding a little bit of space and trying to draw a line between these comments are vision and values. Those comments are very specific about program delivery or a specific site in the district. And we it's not that we won't collect those when they're offered but we are trying to stay focused on the bigger pieces. And then my intent is that we would present, share with you everything, you know, you didn't ask us for this, but we got it anyway, so here you go. And, um, you know, there, so we are not the, the decision makers at that point, of course. Thank you. Um, so just so we leave you with what you need, sounds like we're all on board with, you know, kind of re-envisioning the timeline to how that makes sense. So, you know, why don't you, you know, go ahead and, and begin working working on, on that. Uh, looks like we're good with probably working with, with Matt to reopen it to students for, um, uh, you know, both to fill that that one's you know, the, the seed and, and then obviously you have another person's interest, but it's good to a lot of other folks know that that you know the, the door's open as well. Um, anything else you need clarity on? Uh, no, uh, okay. I appreciate this. I think that the, the other thing to say out loud is the, the, the communication with board members on the committee has been excellent. I'm grateful to that. A good communication with Libby and Jim and uh, HIPCO is terrific. Um, yes. So as far as all those things that's working, you you heard me articulate an idea of what our product might look like. Um, I'm comfortable with 
leaving it there. And also, as uh, thank you, Emma, for your appreciation. I'm flexible with how we go with that, and I don't feel urgent about resolving it with more precision. Uh, if you feel differently, or you you know, as you're driving home, that feels like something to revisit. Just call me back. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think right now it sounds good. And I guess this is we we learn more. We we might want to retune it, but I think we're I think we're at a good place now. So thanks thanks for thanks for making time and sitting through the whole meeting to to get here. Absolutely. Thank you guys. All right. Thank thanks, Nathan. Um, so final uh, item is uh, third policy reading of policy C fourteen. We did not get the right draft in here. <laughs> Should we should we have another third reading? Um, we can have yeah, a fourth we need reading. another third reading because okay. it, we did not fix the. Um, I mean, we started to in our meeting. We did fix the footnotes, but then that draft never made it to okay. Anna. Not Anna's fault. Our fault. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's not ready to be finalized right now the, okay. in this format. We did uh, talk about uh, about adding. Uh, Mia, you had asked about adding a paragraph to these. Um, policies and we've been talking a lot about that we we want to move in that direction um, but what we've decided on these required policies that are highly legalese um, is that we're we're going to steer clear of adding to them and in instead of adding to the actual language of the policy we're planning we've got we've got big plans in the policy committee so one of the things that we're working on is is kind of like a policy manual to help make our policies more user friendly um, to the public, just in general, to students that want to look up a policy or community members that want to look up a policy. And, um, and so we imagine having a, like sort of a short paragraph for each of our policies, uh, giving some background, but not in the language of the policy. So some of the policies, we will do that. And then for others, we'll just, it will be sort of explained in this future policy manual <laughs> that we have yet to draft. So Great. table it for next time. Great, thanks so much. We will have a, another reading of that policy next week. Um, motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn. What is this for? The baton. <laughs> so we can pass the baton after we have a second motion to adjourn and to go yeah. home. <laughs> go a second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.